essential Ari Furata cut content Teal's past before Hajime from any news. Let's see what he has to say. Characters where because of the way she's portrayed, you're kind of set up to not expect that much from her. Yes. I mean, she is literally introduced as someone that we just like we shoved a four ton metal rod made of asmantium, the strongest material in this world, up her dragon bus. You got to see the anal sphincter. Are you gonna take a character like this seriously? No. Hell no, she's just fan service. Right? Up until only a few episodes ago, her impact as a core character has seemed rather minimal. Well, even this scene right now of Teal flying out, that was like a very important thing. Hazmi sometimes does entrust Teal with very important missions and she's a v and she meets, you know, these duties with respect and she and honor. But at the same time, you know, she she then starts to moan about fucking her bussy and it's like kinda ruins the immersion, I guess. But that's her entire brand. Rather minimal. Like, we know she's a dragon man and we know that's pretty yeah. rare, but other than that, there isn't too much else to her. So, just like how we did with Shia, allow me to provide a bit more depth to her. There isn't nearly as much backstory as there was with Shia, but I feel like knowing who she is and how she got here will help you appreciate- Like, this flashback gave a little bit more context on this character and it made me care more about her because she was like one of the last dragon people, the dragon people are like being hunted down by- what was it, the humans or whatnot? Because, you know, they're, everybody's racist here and God of is manipulating everyone. And, and this, her dad was like, one day, you know, someone will appear, it's like a prophecy, and that person is Hajime. And one day, and I just keep memeing, yeah, one day that someone will appear and fucking just penetrate your daughter's ass. Appreciate her character a little bit more. She actually carries quite a lot more weight than you would expect. Yeah. So, if... <laughs> yeah, she does! Tell me that one, one more time, one more time! She carries quite a lot more weight than you would expect. A lot of weight, yep, in the form of that fucking four-ton asmentium rod sticking out of her ass. So, if we go back to episode 9 of season 1, then you'd probably remember how Tio had been tasked with investigating the appearance of some mysterious summons. Visitors from another world whose presence preceded such an immense output of mana that even the hidden dragon men couldn't remain ignorant as to why they were brought here. Mm. What the anime unfortunately didn't show us, though, was a closer look into the tragic events of Tio's childhood. A brief yet revealing extra chapter which detailed exactly how her noble lineage was almost hunted to extinction. Who hunted them? So, going back over half a millennia, the beginning of her story is what marks the end of her people. It was a grim night in which her entire hometown and the once beautiful capital of the moon is red. Her hometown and the once beautiful capital of the dragon men was being invaded and destroyed. What made this particular city more special? What anime is this? This is definitely not Arifurita. ...than most wasn't just the dense population of dragon men, but also the hub for peace that it represented. I don't recognize this Isekai world, but it's very vibrant. You see, up until re- Aren't these like- Isn't this like ReZero? Isn't, it, isn't this the white-haired girl? I'm pretty it's sure it is. Many I think Annie News likes to bring in like different anime scenes just for like imagery sometimes. It's not- Supposed to like, say this is Ari Furuta now. Different races were able to live here together. It didn't matter whether you were deemed Fuck that guy. human or human because there was no discrimination or persecution here. That being the case, the fact this once peaceful nation was now being burnt to the ground was something that Tio simply couldn't understand. Who burnt the dragon people and who could compete with the dragon people? I thought the dragon people were pretty strong. They're burning down dragons? She could only watch in bewilderment as her people were slaughtered and country led to ruin. And as much as she wanted to go down there and fight alongside them, she was more than well aware that she was far too powerless to do anything. So instead, the most she could do was watch from above and despise her own weakness. Huh. It was only a little bit later that the person she feared to lose the most had returned back to safety. Dad. The greatest black dragon to have ever lived and the current ruler of all the dragon men, Karga Claris. The greatest dragon to have ever lived? Okay, now we're getting extra context. This is the stuff that I like, right? You know, stuff that was missing from the anime that gives characters like this more... Just flesh them out more. Since this giant of a man was Tio's father, it only made sense that he was the person she respected most. But for him to return in the injured state that he was, well, that was a sight that would have shocked anyone. Who is fighting? Like, not I don't know. Who, who was able to do all this shit to the dragon of dragons? Like, Tommy what? was Karga known for being the sturdiest dragon alive, but he was also one of the few that had mastered the art of partial transformation. Okay. So, rather than have to turn into a dragon to make oh. his wings, he- Wait! Like, hybrid transformation, right? Like, not complete dragon form. He could instead keep- Yeah, like that! Is Tio ever gonna have a moment like this? Maybe this is spoiling for future seasons, but this would be pretty cool. 
Would that be any beneficial to have a hybrid form like this? Eh, I mean, it's just from whenever Teo transforms back into the Black Dragon, I'm not that... Well, I want to see Big Booba Girl with wings, you know? I'd rather have Big Booba Girl with wings rather than just like a lizard, but... It, it is implied that Noint fought him? What? That's crazy. That's, that's actually crazy, but I don't know. I have seen a, seen a hybrid wing form like this from Tio might be something we can look forward to in the future. ...himself human and spawn them whenever they were needed, making him much more difficult to fight than all the other dragon men, especially since his scales were said to be practically impenetrable. In fact, it was his standard tactic of charging in while blocking everything that had granted him the title of Mobile Fortress. <laughs> so he so just tanks for him everything. to return with tattered armor, bruises, and a body covered with burns and slashes, well, that just meant his opponents were too much for even him to handle. Who were his and opponents? if even he wasn't capable of holding them back, then that most certainly meant that no one else could. Of course, that was an idea Tio didn't want to believe was even possible, but her father's words of defeat had pretty much confirmed it. This noble race who were supposed to be the Guardians of the World had somehow become a target for extermination. Guardians of the World? What are they protecting? The people. They're set for extermination. Gotta heat. It just goes back to... Just, these people are below us because they can't use... But they... But dragons are different. Dragons are different from beast... The reason humans hate beastmen, like Shea, is because... Well, Shea can, you know, have some kind of, like, magical use, but... For the most part, beastmen can't use magic, right? That's why they hate them. But dragons are different. You would think that they would think dragons are really cool. But then again, it's, it's not like de demons can also use magic, but humans still hate on demons. Like, not being able to use magic is just one of the reasons. They're, they're just, it's just God of Heat just whispering just, like, just to be racist to everyone, I think. Even with every country and every species owing them for the peace that they created, all of it meant nothing in the face of this new concerted aggression towards them. They may have been the protectors of peace several years ago, but in the short few years since, that image had somehow drastically changed. Who's the enemies? The dragon men were simply seen as monsters. Oppressors that had turned their backs on God. Heretics hmm. and heathens who could wipe them out whenever. This design is insane. Who the fuck is this? Look, who, is this manga spoiler? This is Hajime here, right? I don't think that this is Tio. Is this when he first meets Teal? If this is, that art is fucking crazy. And this makes me, you know, this makes me, I'm scared of Teal more, but you know how they just said, dragons are like people that's turned their backs on God. That's the common trope you see. The common trope of, oh, you're a heretic. You all turn your back on God. I want to know more about like God hit uh, involvement with the different races that he supported back in the past, because it wasn't just the humans that he used to support, right? Now, that's not to say their power wasn't something to be feared, but their work as ambassadors for peace should have indicated otherwise. You see, the very fact the dragon men were stronger than the rest was the very reason they decided to become so noble in the first place. They strove to turn everyone's fear into awe and then ultimately respect, resulting huh. in the utopia-like capital that they had- Cause Teal pretty sure and even Yui said that the vampires and dragons both knew like the, the like the dragons were very noble beings or was it the vampires were noble beings? I forget. Someone said that. I, I remember like Teal saying we're a very honorable like um like a clan, even though you don't know much about me, you can trust me. It created. It may have taken several centuries to establish, but the end result was a kingdom in which all races were accepted. A global alliance in which all people everywhere were willing to cooperate. Sounds great! That was the foundation the Dragon Men had built their nation upon. Despite all they had done to unite the world, though, somehow that long lost fear had managed to take root again. How? In only a few years, the rest of the world had begun to despise them. How? Resulting in the joint alliance that was invading them now. The reason why still remained a mystery to Tio, but her. Joint alliance. There was like a group effort. So who teamed up? So obviously from the human side, right? It's gotta be. Her father made sure to ensure that she understood whose fault it really was. There was more to his return than to simply tell Tio that they had lost. He needed to teach her one last lesson before his time was up. Initially, Tio wasn't aware that that's why he had returned, but it didn't take long for her to realize that this was the last time she'd see him. Any other girl her age wouldn't have been able to see it, but Tio was far more intelligent than her age would indicate. So it wasn't all that hard for her to piece together this gut-wrenching conclusion. That said, even with all the courage she'd shown up until now, 
Tio still wasn't mature enough to simply disregard the horrid sight she was about to set her eyes upon. It was as her and her father were in mid-conversation that a massive explosion would rock the capital right at its center. What? No, it no, this is so good so powerful, only an empty crater was left behind by it. There was nothing left other than ruin and rubble now. But this attack is just so mysterious. I just want to know who fought. Like, I, 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 who exactly was there? What was the joint alliance? What is this beam attack? Even so, this still wasn't what Tio was so disturbed by. No. The event that went to push Tio past her breaking point was the countless pillars of wood being erected in the aftermath. What? Wooden crosses that each carried the charred body of a crucified dragon man. What? So, as Tio watched her people's mangled corpses go up on display, it was the vivid sight of her mother's that made her lose herself. Oh! The gentle yet ferocious warrior who had once killed Oh. What? There's a little bit of an artistic choice of like wooden fucking crosses. It's gotta be that this is just heavily like church influence. Like gotta hate the corrupt church and all that. But god damn. I guess if they showed this in the anime, I feel like I would have cared more about Tio than I do now. You know? Cared for her was now a lifeless corpse intended to be a warning for the rest of them. Holy shit. Of course, Tio was incredibly enraged by what she'd seen, but she was more so confused as to why her father wasn't doing anything to avenge her. I mean, the sight alone was enough to make Tio's jet black mana emanate uncontrollably, yet here was her father just sitting here doing nothing. Because he couldn't. That may have been how it seemed to her, Why? but to anyone else it was quite obvious Cargo was right where he needed to be. If not for his strong embrace holding Tio tight, then who knows what rash move she would have done to avenge her people herself. So, as he did his best to calm her down, Cargo made sure to reinforce what it meant to be one of the Dragon Men. Despite this being the fate of their people for now, Cargo was certain a time would come when their presence would be needed again. So, in order to ensure that Tio would follow the noble path ahead of her, Cargo made her repeat the vow the Dragon Men had made with the world numerous centuries ago. It was a mantra that highlighted everything the Dragon Men were supposed to stand for. Hold up, this is so long, I'm not gonna read all of it, but I think it's more of like, we are so strong that we need to use our noble, our strongness for peace and stuff like that, right? When we forget our compassion, we are no more than beasts, so long as we wield the sword of reason. Kind of like... I mean, the dragon people were such intelligent, noble creatures, but even them, they just get fucked upon. Why? It's because they got too much power. I guess God of Heat and them just got insecure. Why did... I mean, it took like a joint effort to take them down, so I guess it means that they were really that strong, but I want to know... Who actually attacked them? We need more about this, like, flashback. Maybe they'll explain it in the future anime seasons, but maybe they won't. Maybe we've already seen all of it and it's just kind of glossed over. A chant bearing the very last lesson her father would ever give her. Considering the amount of weight that these words carried, it was as soon as they were said that Tio was able to come to a crucial realization. She now understood that if she was to give in to her anger, then all that would amount to was the betrayal of the pride of her people. So, rather than allow her emotions to get the best of her, Tio instead sat quietly and listened closely to what needed to be heard. She had taken her people's principles to heart and used it to quell her anger. As for what her father had to say next, well- I'm sorry, I just- I don't know why I'm thinking about this right now. I, I don't know why I'm thinking about this right now, but you know that scene where the mom got put on a pillar like that? Where, where is it? I, I don't know why, but I was thinking, well, where did Tio get all this degenerate, you know, horny behavior from? And I was going to relate it to maybe she learned from her parents, like her mom or dad. And now you see the mom here bolted on the cross like this. And then, I don't know why, but then my brain thought, wouldn't it be hilarious if the mom was, like, being horny for this? Like, oh my god, I'm finally stamped to a cross. Please, shove this cross up my ass. It's probably, no, that's not what happened at all. But I don't know why my brain went to immediately that. I, I, I'm just a terrible person. I'm just a terrible person. Say next. Well, the first thing was to clarify who the true enemies were. Who yes, are they? the rest of the world was the one attacking them, but they weren't the true enemy Tio had to look out for. As I'm sure you could have guessed already, God, it was the I gods hate... and their devious plans who had made the situation turn out this way. Karga had tried to make a world where the gods were no longer needed, but he simply wasn't fast enough to diminish the heavy reliance the rest of the races had on them, the result of which was the genocide currently taking place before him. Now, because Karga was well aware of just how cunning these powerful gods were, he wasn't so naive as to challenge them without a backup plan. You see, in the unlikely case that something like this did in fact happen, 
A simple measure was set in place to ensure the survival of his people. It wasn't a plan that could save everyone, but a hidden village was created for a select few dragon men to live until their time would come again. It was a place so far outside from the main continent that even the path to get there was one that the gods themselves couldn't discover. That is such a creepy picture of God just staring you down like this. He can always see what you're doing. So this was the place where Tio would go while the rest stayed here. That's not to say that she would be alone, but in order for this plan to work, very few could go along with her. The dragon men needed to appear as if they were wiped out tonight. If they didn't, then the other races would surely do all they could to find them. That's why Karga had no other choice but to stay and meet the same fate as all the others. Huh. That said, there was a small beacon of light- His sacrifice was necessary for them to live out in this remote village? ...be found in this rather bleak situation. Apparently, her late grandfather was already at the village waiting for her. As for how that was possible, well, after the former king had become aware of the gods' tendencies to meddle, he decided to work with Karga to form various precautions, one of which was to fake his death then head to the hidden village himself. Of course, the supposed death of the strongest red dragon was nothing short of a tragedy, but it was a necessity to ensure the dragon men would never- So the grandfather is the strongest red dragon ever? ...never truly go extinct. It was their last ploy to give them another chance at freeing the world from its tyrannical rulers. So, with that being everything Karga had to say, his last words were his wife's dying message. A final farewell intended to let T- You are the pride and joy of the Claris line, one of the forgotten dragon lineages. And what will you do now? You'll just be remembered as a horny degenerate. A final farewell intended to let Tio know just how special she was. You inherited my black skills, your mother's horniness, and your grandfather's fire breath. It may not have come directly from her mother herself, but they were words that were sure to stick with her forever. How did they fucking give a character like this with such a bad, like a, sorry, like a sad backstory? How did they, why did they make her into such a fucking horny slut? Well, I'm not, I mean, the fan service is funny here and there, but it's just like, the, the, the contrast of her, like, character and her, her flashback, it just makes me feel bad. Forever. This was Karga's last gift to her before he would fly off and return to the battlefield. Now, if you're wondering how a nation of dragons lost to the invading forces of a bunch of weaker races, well, the reason for that was actually due to their noble lineage. You see, even with all the other races having turned against them, the dragon men still couldn't bring themselves to truly fight against them. So they were so strong and so noble, they felt bad. So they were like, ah, you know what, we'll just let you kill us. What? Because killing them would only appeal to the gods who caused this, the dragon huh. men had gone to extreme lengths to- So it would like prove to God of Heat that they were right, that dragon people were something to be feared, so they didn't fight as back as hard as they- Nah, they should have fucking wiped them out, bro. All of them deserve to just die. ...sure that they didn't kill anyone. They would rather sacrifice themselves than give the gods the satisfaction of the massacre that they Dumb. Really hoped for. Dumb. That was the legacy of the dragon men from so many centuries ago. What remained of them now was a small village located on an island far from the continent. A place where Tio would spend the next half a millennia until the current present we see in the anime. A turning point in time where she could finally stake her life for something great just like how her parents did. After having followed her father's last wish to stay alive, she was now done with simply living and instead ready to pursue the life that she truly wanted. One that could hopefully change the world just like the dragon men who came before her. But yeah. That's pretty much Tio's backstory. I'm not sure if she gets more in the later volumes of the novels, but as of where we are now, I do believe that's pretty much everything. So, as always, thank you so much for watching, and if you enjoyed another great video by Annie News, kind of sad that all these girls just have such sad backstories, but you see this that sad backstory, even like Shea to an extent, right? Give, a, give him a like and a sub if you enjoyed that, but you see all these sad backstories, but then you look at all the, all the fan service that's happening at the same time, and it's weird when you start sexualizing a girl like that who's had such a sad past. I don't know, man. I just feel, I just feel terrible about it. But still, it's like her running gag. It's her, it's her brand. And I wish we got to see more of her mom, but it is what it is. But by the way, we do these reactions live on stream on YouTube and Twitch 7 a.m. PST. Hope to see you there.